Brad Gerstner is a legendary Silicon Valley investor, and he's someone I pay close attention to. I think you'll find great value in this clip. We're coming up on the third anniversary of ChatGPT. We've come a long way fast. Um, you know, you've seen NVIDIA add almost $200 billion of revenue in the last three years. Yeah. Truly extraordinary. Transformational phase shift, uh, super cycle going on in our economy. It added 100 basis points to GDP this year. But remember, this year we had two 25 percent drawdowns in NVIDIA. It hit 90 bucks earlier in the year on the deep seek scare. Right. Right. And so there's going to be volatility when you're early in these phase shifts. Right. That's that wall of worry prevents the bubble that everybody's worried about. And when you look at the multiples today, take NVIDIA, for example, I think it's trading at 23, 24 times fully taxed earnings yeah. on next year's numbers, 18 times on 27 numbers. That is not the stuff that bubbles are made of. Right. I think the rest of the mag seven all trades somewhere between 25 and 30 times. Um, maybe Meta's at 21 times uh, earnings. So to me, taking a little of the gas out, having some of these, uh, uh, you, you know, conversations and debate, very healthy. Um, and what I see out there right now is a tremendous amount of progress on the model side. But I think the diffusion, how, the rate at which this transforms lives, both consumer lives and enterprise, that takes time. Um, and that's what we're seeing play out. We're seeing the debates about NVIDIA versus Broadcom, Google versus OpenAI. Well, I, I, yes, and that's what I was going to get to. Is the new version of Gemini better than ChatGPT? It's terrific. It's terrific. Remember, a year ago, we were counting uh, you know, Google out of the equation. I've said on Twitter and otherwise, we own Google. Yeah. Um, I've said it's very difficult to pick a winner here. So you can own them all. You can own OpenAI and Anthropic. You can own Google uh, and, and Microsoft. Um, and I think at this phase, you know, it, you probably should do that. I think Google's done an incredible job. Remember a year ago, Satya was saying, you know, we're making Google dance. Mm -hmm. I think Sundar is making people do a little dancing today. Yeah. Um, and so that is that's part of the competitive dynamic that I think is great for the country. It's what's going to keep us on the leading edge. That, that's great for the technology spending. There are a lot of questions about what this means for the business world, too, for enterprise. Um, yesterday, Jensen Wong was on Squawk on the Street with Jim Cramer talking a little bit about that deal that they did with Synopsys. And that was pretty interesting to hear how it's got to be able to be used by these big industrial companies to be able to really make the next steps. Right. And Jensen made the point that I thought was really interesting, that 90 percent accuracy is OK if you're dealing with consumers. It is not OK if you're in any of these big enterprise issues. That's right. That's right. Think about it this way. The machine that builds the machine. Right. That's really what he's talking about. We saw that with Tesla and Elon. Right. Elon used to talk about we can't get to where we need to get to with electric cars until we first build the machine. Right. A totally new way to manufacture cars that can drive down the cost. And that's what you see Jensen talking about, for example, in the design of chips. Right. That you really imbue the entire industrial economy with A.I., and all of those benefits lie before us. I think we're going we're heading into a very significant productivity boom. I've talked about the golden age of margin expansion for a lot of industrial and other companies in America that can simply do more with less. Our economy is going to see that productivity tailwind. Um, and, you know, but it's never a straight line up and to the right, Becky. And so I think for people who are watching it, you know, you, you've got to anticipate we're going to have volatility. I remember early in the Internet super cycle, Google would be up five or 10 percent a day early in the. Remember when Facebook went public? Right. And then it, it broke seven or broke twenty dollars a share. Yeah. Right. It broke issuance because everybody was worried. Could they possibly monetize on these mobile devices? When you're early in these super cycles, there's a lot of questions. And that's where right. we are that, today. You're in talking AI. about the winners that came out of that. There was a lot of volatility in Pets.com, too. For there's sure. Web van. And by the way, those companies went bust. And there are going to be companies in this cycle that go bust. Yeah. There are a thousand companies in Silicon Valley valued over a billion dollars that are trying to raise money. It's not going to be equally easy for all of them. Right. But I think that's part of the process of creative destruction. Right. It's OK. That, you, you know, that some companies aren't going to make it. We talked earlier this morning about some comments from Masasan, who said that he didn't want to sell his entire NVIDIA stake, but he had to in order to be able to put it into open AI. You've got bids on or bets on both of those companies. Yes. So what do you think about that? I Which wish my bet in open AI was as big as Masas. But, you know, you, you, would you, you sacrifice your NVIDIA <laughs> bet for it. No, I, like I said, like I said. NVIDIA has been an extraordinary winner. We invested in NVIDIA in December of 22, right after we saw ChatGPT. The stock's up over 10, 10 times 
uh, 10x over that period of time as the revenue went from roughly $30 billion a year to over $200 billion a year. And they just told us that we should expect a run rate by the end of next year of $100 billion. Mm -hmm. And this is at the same time that Broadcom is doing extraordinarily well. What Hock Tan has done partnering with Google to build out TPU7 is extraordinary. That's going to force NVIDIA to be even better. So I think we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of winners. And you can see from the logos that Altimeter owns, our choice has been really to own a lot of the best names that are benefiting from this super cycle. NVIDIA has added $200 billion in revenue over three years, while the AI revolution contributed an entire percentage point of GDP growth, proving this AI cycle isn't just speculation, but a fundamental economic transformation. Yet even as this super cycle rewrites the rules of computing, Google went from being counted out of the AI race to making every competitor scramble with Gemini's 3 release, revealing that owning and distribution and infrastructure matters more than having the best model. Brad Gessner describes the current phase as this, a transformational phase shift super cycle going on in our economy that has added a hundred basis points of GDP growth this year. When AI adds an entire percentage point to GDP, that represents hundreds of billions of dollars in real economic output, not financial engineering or valuation games. GDP measures actual goods and services produced. A 100 basis point increase means the economy generated 1% more value this year than it would have done without AI. That translates to hundreds of billions of dollars in additional economic activity for the US economy alone. This isn't companies buying each other stock or venture capitalists making up private valuations. This is measurable productivity improvements flowing through the economy. The infrastructure spending driving this shows up in concrete ways. Companies are building massive data centers, consuming gigawatts of power. NVIDIA is manufacturing and shipping hundreds of billions of dollars worth of actual physical chips. Cloud providers are deploying servers at unprecedented scale. Construction crews are building facilities. Electrical utilities are expanding capacity. Equipment manufacturers are scaling production. All of this represents real economic activity, employing real people, producing real outputs. NVIDIA's revenue growth from $30 billion to over $200 billion in three years captures a fraction of the total infrastructure build-out. For every dollar NVIDIA captures selling chips, customers spend multiples more on power, infrastructure, cooling, networking, equipment, facility construction, and operations. The total capital expenditure across the AI infrastructure stack runs into the trillions when you account for Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Meta, and other hyperscalers, plus enterprise developments. This capital deployment creates jobs, drives innovation, adjacent industries, and generates economic multiplier effects throughout the supply chain. The GDP contribution validates that this spending produces actual value rather than just shifting resources around. If companies were building AI infrastructure that didn't improve productivity, GDP wouldn't budge. The capital would get spent, but wouldn't generate additional output. The 100 basis point increases proves that AI infrastructure enables companies to produce more goods and services with the same inputs. Manufacturers optimize processes, logistics companies route more efficiently, software developers write code faster, customer service teams handle more queries. These productivity improvements compound across millions of businesses, creating measurable economic growth. This fundamentally differs from previous technology bubbles. The dot-com boom saw massive stock valuations for companies with no revenue and no path to profitability. Burned billions without creating sustainable economic value. The infrastructure built during that era, particularly fiber optic networks, eventually proved valuable, but only after a decade of bankruptcies and write downs. AI infrastructure generates returns immediately through measurable productivity gains. Companies deploying AI see faster turnaround times, reduced error rates, and improved decision making. The economic value shows up in current GDP, not speculative future predictions. The scale of NVIDIA's growth also demonstrates real value rather than speculation. You can't fake $200 billion in chip sales. Those are physical products manufactured in fabs, shipped to customers, installed in data centers and powered to run on workloads. The revenue represents actual compute capacity deployed and generating value. When customers spend $200 billion on chips plus multiples more on supporting infrastructure, they're making capital allocation decisions based on expected returns. 
The continued investment validates that early deployments are delivering ROI sufficiently to justify expansion. And in addition, the 100 basis point GDP contribution in a single year does suggest this is early in the adoption curve, not late. And the reason for that is most businesses haven't deployed AI at scale yet. Enterprise adoption lags behind hyperscaler deployments by years. Industrial applications are just beginning. If we're already seeing 1% GDP impact with limited adoption, the curve effect over the next decade could add way more total economic output. That scale of productivity transformation doesn't happen very often, maybe a couple of times a century. The industrial revolution, electrification, and computerization represent comparable shifts. AI appears to be a similar magnitude transformation happening faster than previous technology transitions. But while infrastructure spending and GDP growth proves AI's economic value, the battle for who captures that value is being won by companies with distribution advantages that the market completely underestimated. Google going from counted out to making competitors dance with Gemini 3 validates that distribution advantages and existing infrastructure can be first mover advantages in the foundational model competition. A year ago, the entire market wrote off Google as an AI loser. OpenAI and Microsoft dominated Mindshare ChatGPT became synonymous with AI in popular culture. Microsoft integrated ChatGPT into everything from Bing to Office. Microsoft CEO openly taunted Google, saying Microsoft would make them dance through competitive pressure. Analysts questioned whether Google could even compete in the AI era they helped create. The stock suffered as investors priced in a scenario where Google's search monopoly got destroyed by ChatGPT and AI-powered alternatives. I'm happy to say I was able to buy the dip in those moments. Today, Gemini 3 beats ChatGPT on most benchmarks. Google's AI products integrate across Search, Gmail, Docs, YouTube, and Android. The panic about Google being disrupted looks absurd in retrospect. The reversal didn't happen because Google hired better researchers or discovered breakthrough algorithms. OpenAI and Anthropic still employ top talent. The shift happened because Google's distribution advantages and existing infrastructure creates moats that first mover advantage can't overcome. Distribution means reaching users without acquiring them. ChatGPT gained users through viral adoption and media coverage. That works for reaching early adopters and tech enthusiasts. It doesn't scale to billions of mainstream users who never download new apps. Google reaches these users through products they already use daily. Search handles 8 billion queries per day. Gmail has 2 billion users. YouTube serves billions of hours of video. Android powers billions of phones. Chrome dominates web browsing. Every one of those products becomes a distribution channel for Google's AI. The integration advantage compounds over time. Google can make Gemini the default AI assistant across every product. Users don't need to learn a new interface or download a new app. The AI just appears as a better version of tools they already rely on. Search results get enhanced with AI generated summaries. Gmail suggests better email responses. Docs helps with writing. YouTube recommends more relevant content. Hopefully you think it's done a good job today with this video. The AI improves existing workflows rather than requiring behavior changes. This reduces friction to adoption by orders of magnitude compared to asking users to visit a new website or download a new app. It can be very tiring trying to keep up to date with the latest apps and tech and applications which are available for use. Infrastructure advantages matter just as much. Google built massive data center capacity, custom TPU chips, and global fiber networks over decades. This infrastructure was already deployed and paid for through search revenue. Adding AI workloads to existing infrastructure costs relatively little on the margin. Google doesn't need to raise billions to build data centers like OpenAI. They already have the facilities, the power contracts, the cooling systems, and the networking. The capital expenditure happened years ago, amortized across different business lines. And the data advantage creates another moat. Google indexes the entire web through search. They have billions of users' behavioral data across products. They process millions of hours of video through YouTube. They handle trillions of queries showing what information people actually want. This data feeds AI training in ways competitors can't match. OpenAI scrapes public web data 
Google owns proprietary data showing how people actually use information across contexts. That difference in data quality compounds into better AI models that understand user intent more accurately. If I could recommend one place to start learning AI, it would be the course I put together. It's clear, structured, and designed for beginners who want to get genuinely knowledgeable about AI. Once you join, you'll get lifetime access to all lessons, including future models, and just a heads up, the price rises as more modules get added. So it's currently at the lowest price you'll see. Picture this, a potential client searches for what your business offers and your YouTube video appears. Before they've even booked a call, they've built trust with you, turning them into a warm lead. That's why our clients are hitting $100,000 months because YouTube turns attention into authority. If you run a business, book a call and I'll show you exactly how to make this happen.